two great speakers. Uh, certainly the topics have caught people's imagination is, is what I'm hearing. <laughs> and our first speaker is Lindsay Bay from PHRI. So Lindsay, yeah. set it up the way you like. Sure. Just to share if you like. <coughs> Do that and then is it, is it sharing? No, it's not actually. So let's go back. OK, so we need to go back to Teams. So we can scroll down to PowerPoint Live. Something else? Yeah. Great. If it's not, if people can't see it on the screen, please, uh, please let us know. Okay. Are you not supposed to see people on Teams while you're presenting? Um, Alicia, you did this recently. <laughs> there you go. Close the transcript. I don't think we need that open. And then full screen, that might be all right. Yeah. I may just ask that now. Can everyone see that? Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Okay, the full screen. So, are we? Is that in full screen mode on the? No, not for us. I think it is on full screen. I think on the. Sorry. Any press the three dots, that's right, fine, that's yeah. a good idea. What are the three dots are the main presentation? Oh, hi, it's presented. Hi, it's presented. Ha! Okay, so thank you, thank you very much, everybody. So um, it's great to be able to present some of my work to you today. Um, I joined St George's a year ago. I'm professor of physical therapy and rehabilitation with the HRI, and my overarching research is around evaluating the consequences and rehabilitation of people with long-term conditions. And today I'm going to talk to you about some work that we've been completing, which we're really trying to understand how we can best support people with peripheral arterial disease to change their behaviour so they take up and continue walking exercise. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to cover the problem that we're trying to address, introduce you to a new intervention that we developed and tested in a randomised controlled trial, which included quite a robust process evaluation. And then I'm going to share with you some of our the next steps that we hope to take. So peripheral arterial disease is an atherosclerotic condition. It's present in one in five older adults. There's equal prevalence between men and women, but slightly greater prevalence in people from Afro-Caribbean communities, South Asian communities and Eastern European communities. One of the symptoms of peripheral arterial disease is intermittent claudication. This is an ischemic leg pain that occurs on walking and it can occur in the calf, in the, in the thigh and in the buttock. And what happens is people commence walking, pain in their legs gradually increases, causes a cramping sensation, which means that people have to stop and rest until the pain subsides. And of course, this you can understand this is very disabling and impacts on people's quality of life. There's good evidence to support how we should treat people with intermittent claudication. Supervised exercise programmes have level one evidence. And if they are um, uh, provided um, effectively, then it can increase people's walking capacity <coughs> by up to 200%. <coughs> 
And international guidelines actually give us some really, really clear advice on how we should provide um, supervised exercise therapy. We're supposed to offer it for three months, three times a week, and people are supposed to come into a centre for at least 60 minutes and walk on a treadmill at a pace that elicits pain within three to five minutes. And they're encouraged to carry on walking until they um, are experiencing near maximal pain when they stop and rest and start again. So it's a walk, rest, walk, rest cycle. But as you can imagine, this is a pretty hard sell for people for a number of reasons. Um, we're expecting people to do the very activity that elicits the symptoms that disables them. So it can be counterintuitive. Recent surveys have suggested that only 48% of UK vascular units actually are able to provide access to supervised exercise programmes for their patients. And there are a number of provider barriers to this, mainly around resources. There are very high setup costs, it requires quite experienced staff, it is quite time intensive. But there are also barriers for patients as well. So even when it is provided as recommended, non-enrolment to supervised exercise programmes is as high as 50% and non-completion is 30%. So the uptake of these programmes is not great. A further issue that we have is even if people do complete supervised exercise programmes, the transitions for and get better, improve their walking, the transition from supervised exercise programmes to community-based walking, so long-term walking, is really poor. So people's, the benefits that people get from supervised exercise programmes um, attenuate very quickly. And you'll be pleased to know that this challenge that we're facing is reflected internationally. So it's not particularly anything to do with our health system. It's a very hard sell. And so what we need to do is we need a new approach to dealing with this issue. We need something which is feasible to deliver in any healthcare system, something which is acceptable to patients, and also something which supports people to walk in the long term. And so this is the problem that we hope to address. So structured home-based exercise has been kind of increasing in um, uh, receiving increasing attention for the long term uh, over the last few years. Unfortunately, at the moment, evidence to support them is quite mixed. We know that home based exercise therapy does improve walking capacity compared to supervised exercise, um, sorry, compared to baseline or usual care, but it's inferior to supervised exercise. And there are a variety of reasons for this. The um, findings are compounded by low quality studies, so small sample sizes. Fidelity is often unmeasured. Sometimes the interventions haven't got any strong theoretical foundation to underpin them. And many of them are delivered by highly qualified psychologists um, or researchers, and so are not really transferable or applicable into practice. So we, um, myself, Melissa Glear, Glear Holmes and Professor John Wyman at King's um, decided that we were going to see if we could tackle this problem. And so we um, developed a new intervention to try and improve the um, delivery of home-based exercise for people with peripheral arterial disease. We followed the MRC guidelines for the development of complex interventions and we worked really closely with stakeholders such as clinicians, um, patients and policymakers. And here are just some articles that we published along the way as we developed our new intervention. So our new intervention was called the Mosaic Intervention, so Motivating Structured Walking Activity and Intermittent Claudication. And it is a one-to-one -one individualized physiotherapy-led um, intervention. There are, it includes four sessions delivered over 12 weeks. And the first two sessions are delivered in person for 60 minutes duration each. And the second two sessions are delivered via the telephone. And this is important later on. The intervention includes both mandatory and optional behaviour change techniques which target both the motivation to walk as well as the long term commitment to walking. And it's delivered using a motivational interviewing approach, which is a very collaborative person centred approach, which um, guides people to try and increase their motivation to change. 
The crucial component of it, alongside the behavioural aspects, is a progressive walking exercise plan, which takes the individual from where they are now up to guideline walking. The intervention is supported by a range of materials, so pedometer, workbook, logbook, etc. And it is underpinned with a couple of um, psychological theories that have been shown to have utility for increasing physical activity in older people and also peripheral arterial degrees, disease. We also have spent quite a lot of time designing and delivering a training programme for the physiotherapists who are going to uh, deliver this intervention. They had two days interactive training um, where we taught them what the motivation, what the mosaic intervention components were, the behaviour, how to deliver the behaviour change techniques, which were we knew were important and targeted walking. And we also taught them how to deliver it using a motivational interviewing approach. We also provided them with ongoing support to try and prevent drift from the intervention. So this was both individual one-to-one -one support and group supervision. And we provided a clinician manual and treatment checklist for all the sessions that they were due to deliver. So after a successful feasibility trial, we obtained some funding from the Dunhill Medical Trust to do a small um, phase two efficacy trial to really understand whether mo Mosaic was effective in the short term or e efficacious in the short term. And we wanted to answer the question, does Mosaic improve walking capacity at three months compared to usual NHS care? We delivered the trial in six centres we recruited 190 people who had peripheral arterial disease, intermittent claudication, who weren't achieving the guideline recommendations. And they were randomised one to one to receive usual care or usual care plus mosaic. And we reassessed people at three months and six months. And alongside this, we conducted a process evaluation to evaluate the proficiency fidelity delivery of the intervention and also to understand the acceptability from both the participants and the clinicians perspectives. So our trial outcomes were six minute walk distance. This was a primary outcome and we only collected it at three months due to resource limitations. So three months was our primary endpoint. Alongside that, we collected a suite of secondary outcomes. This included um, self-reported walking limitation, activities of daily living and quality of life questionnaires. So what did our participants look like? So we had the majority of our participants were male. They had a mean age of 68 years and the majority were white. And at the three months, we found that there was an adjusted mean group distance difference between mosaic and the usual care arms that favoured mosaic. And whilst this might not seem a very large difference, it was above the clinical, the minimal clinically important difference quite substantially. And we also found that the um, intervention was effective in some, but not, not all of our secondary outcomes. So particularly maximum walking distance, walking limitation, activities of daily living, but not quality of life. As I mentioned, we also followed our participants up at six months. We weren't powered to detect a change and we only had resources to collect some of the self-reported outcomes. And what we found that one of the outcomes also um, was remained, the remained a difference between the groups at six months that favoured Mosaic. But clearly the intervention effects were waning. So we then wanted to understand in a little bit more detail about fidelity of delivery and also acceptability. So we conducted a quite a rigorous um, fidelity of delivery evaluation. We asked all our physiotherapists to record all the sessions that they delivered in, in all the 95 participants that they um, treated. And we selected a 20% random sample of these audio recordings and we had these rated by two independent raters for two aspects. First of all for fidelity um, to delivery of the mandatory mosaic items and the behaviour change techniques that we required them to deliver and secondly for proficiency in motivational interviewing and for that we used a standardised motivational interviewing treatment integrity 
scale. So here's what our fidelity checklist looked like. The whole, and you can see that the mandatory item that of interest is listed on the left hand side, a definition and an example was given and our raters considered whether or not the therapist had actually um, delivered those either fully or partially or not delivered. And we considered high fidelity delivery for that session was to be regarded as if over 80% of the mandatory components were delivered fully or partially in each session. So turning to motivational interviewing proficiency for this, we randomly selected a 20 minute segment of each of the audio recorded sessions that we were rating. And we looked at those or listened to those sessions and rated the therapist's interpersonal style and their ability to deliver a motivational interviewing approach. And this is kind of called the spirit of MI. And also for the technical MI te techniques delivered within that segment. And each of these are scored out of five. And you can see that there is a standardized threshold that was provides that is provided so we can rate whether our therapists were had fair proficiency or good proficiency. So here are the results of our um, fidelity analysis on the left hand side you'll see is the session number so one, two, three, four. Uh, the second column indicates the number of mandatory components that the therapists were re required to deliver for each session. And the third um, Component column um, tells you how many of the sessions of those samples the therapist actually achieved or delivered at least 80% of the mandatory elements. And what you can see is high fidelity was achieved in the first two sessions, which were the in person sessions, but not the telephone sessions. Overall, fidelity of delivery was 79%, which is just shy of the target of 80% that we were aiming for. And what that translates to is in 49 out of the 62 files rated, at least 80% of the components were delivered effectively. We also looked at motivational interviewing proficiency, and you can see when it comes to the technical aspects, our therapists achieved fair motivational interviewing proficiency. Whereas when it came to the relational aspects, that was only achieved in the in-person sessions. And this is really important information for us because what it shows us that, well, the first thing to note is in session three and session four, the content of those sessions is really focused toward long term maintenance of behaviour. So relapse prevention, action planning for long term walking. And clearly those sessions were not delivered as well as we hoped. And this may provide an explanation why the intervention effects may be waning. There are lots of explanations and that may be one of them. The other thing that's really important about this is it shows us that we need to revise our therapist training to really um, support people to be able to deliver the intervention via telephone or remotely. So when we look towards um, participants experiences and acceptability, we interviewed 20 out of the 95 people who completed the mosaic intervention to, to get a sense of whether they thought it was going to be something that um, could be engaged with, because that was one of the problems with the existing provision supervised exercise therapy. And what we found was that um, people with who completed the intervention liked it. They really enjoyed being supported by knowledgeable healthcare professional physiotherapists who were able to support them to understand why they should walk and to complete that on a regular basis. They began to feel much more confident about walking as a treatment, which previously they'd overlooked as a treatment option completely. And they developed skills that supported them towards self-management. And they also noted that by doing walking exercise, their walking capacity increased and therefore it had an impact on their everyday life that was very positive. Some of the participants did tell us that they thought that four sessions was a very short number of sessions and they would have liked more engagement with the physiotherapist, particularly towards the latter part of the intervention. So when we talked to our clinicians, we had 15 physiotherapists who delivered the intervention and we interviewed all of them and we found out what they thought about the intervention and um, they, um, broadly speaking, enjoyed the training and found the um, training valuable. 
They particularly liked having ongoing support, so regular check-in with the training team to make sure that they were delivering the intervention as they hoped accurately. They began translating some of the techniques that they learned into their wider practice, particularly around the motivational interviewing. And they also told us of things that they didn't like about the intervention, of which doing treatment via the telephone seemed to be one of them, which kind of which kind of is uh, uh, aligns with our findings of the fidelity analysis that perhaps this medium is not something that at the time people felt comfortable using for treatment. So just in summary about the trial, we we now understand that Mosaic does improve walking in the short term, was mostly de delivered as intended and was acceptable, but there is quite a lot more questions still outstanding. We need to refine the intervention a little bit more and we need to do some further investigation before it can really um, address the gap in service provision. But we feel it's promising. So our long term ambition with this is to really develop um, a, an intervention which is effective, acceptable and implementable in the community. So what we're doing at the moment, we're currently refining the intervention and the clini clinician training and we're waiting for the outcome of a funding application to complete an effectiveness implementation trial to explore the longer term effects of Mosaic, the cost effectiveness and to understand more the factors that might influence the scale up and spread of Mosaic, particularly looking at delivery in primary care and also expanding the professional groups that we're training to deliver Mosaic so that it can be delivered with fidelity by any registered clinician. So just as I wrap up, I'd like to just acknowledge the my co-investigators and the trial team that spent work very hard to deliver the Mosaic trial on a very small budget and the trial participants and trial sites and the Dunhill Medical Trust who have actually supported this work in its entirety so far. So thank you very much for your attention. Title makes sense. <laughs> That's good. Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Thank you. I always like hearing about this study. I share an office with you. I've heard quite a lot about it. <laughs> um, I'm interested um, in that sort of shift that happens in that session one, two, three, and four. And I don't know because you did an amazing piece of work in terms of getting recordings of all those sessions, but how much of a sense you got that the physiotherapists were still working very much in a sort of manager teacher expert role, or how much you felt you did get that shift to then the patients at the end feeling, you know, I've got this, I'm okay, because I just picked up on that feedback that you got that people said they would have liked more sessions, which in a way, we always know that people would like more sessions, but obviously that's not the question that you're answering is how many, it's more about the shift. So I don't know if you'll sense that there's more work to be done to look at that. Yeah, so I think our ther physiotherapists did a great job of um, delivering Mosaic as it was intended. And it is actually quite a change in style for clinicians to go from um, telling people what to do to supporting people to make a decision, um, which the physiotherapist might not always agree with. Um, we felt that it was very personal. Some physiotherapists did that extremely well and other people, and other people found it more difficult. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, does then reflect on whether the patients were able to take on that self-management approach a little bit yeah. more. So I think we do have some more work to do with the clinician training. And I suppose the other point I ought to make that this trial was conducted before COVID when nobody was particularly used well, when we moved, transitioned more towards delivering interventions remotely on the telephone. And it may be that if we do this again, because we're all much more now comfortable and confident mm. delivering interventions mm. remotely, that may change our outcomes. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Lindsay. So it's really interesting. Um, I'm just trying to a physio physios prefer the face-to-face -face intervention rather than the telephone calls. We'll identify with that. Um, 
Yeah. Thought it's brilliant. What I just wonder whether you feel this could expand out to other conditions where pain is a sort of barrier to accessing benefits of exercise and people can use that pain and move them. Um, just want to put your thoughts on that. So I think the principles and the structure could be expanded out. Um, obviously, a lot of the preliminary work we did was to identify what the determinants of walking were in this particular group of patients, and then we mapped the behaviour change techniques that we included in each of the sessions to those determinants. So just as long as that preliminary work was done, so we understood what the um, determinants of movement due to pain, you know, what, what the wider determinants were for that activity, then I think the um, format and the shape of it could be lifted and uh, expanded. Great talk, thank you. Um, apologies if I misunderstood, but when you were talking about the, the type of operation that was having these uh, problems with walking, you mentioned the um, Afro-Caribbean population, I believe, and other, other sort of uh, groups that were not quite I, I noticed that in your study you, you said that we're mainly white. Uh, is there any reason uh, for that? And uh, in any case, are you planning to consider those groups that seem to be? Yeah, I'm glad you noticed the baseline um, characteristics of our participants. I actually took out another next steps for us, which is around inequity of access to exercise trials and service provision. And we've actually recently done a systematic review to see whether the findings, the baseline characteristics of our trial were similar to others and if there were kind of socioeconomic determinants or, or demographic factors that may influence this. And I think it is a common problem with child trials genuine, uh, generally and particularly with exercise-based trials in this condition. And although we worked with the stakeholder group throughout the whole um, of this process, I think we're going to need to do more to really engage with communities from uh, that are underserved in this particular population to understand what are the barriers to um, engaging with trials. You know, we only had 30% female and yet there's a similar gender or sex balance in peripheral arterial disease and we really are, um, ethnic mix was, was um, poor for this, so. We are, it is something that we're aware of and we will be working as a kind of stream of activity along to, alongside our next research trials. Uh, oh, we have got a hand up. Uh, Arena. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much. That, that was fascinating, really. Um, did I understand that right, that that was a uh, multi-center trial? And if that is the case, how many centers did you have? And whether if you learn anything about uh, uh, contamination in the process, because if I understand it right, uh, the, the randomization was at individual level. Thank you. So, I, sorry, I, I didn't quite hear all of that, but certainly in answer to oh. the first part, it was six centres in um, southeast London that we conducted the trial. Okay, okay. And did you ask about contamination? Yes, yes, it, it, within the intervention. If, uh, it, and if, you know, uh, taking this further, don't you think that the pragmatic cluster trial would, would be somewhat a uh, better, better solution for the design? Yeah, so we did try very hard to make sure that the physiotherapists who were treating participants um, delivering mosaic were, um, were, if you like, separated and were not part of the usual care delivery team. And that did vary depending on which, which hospitals, because sometimes the hospitals were quite small and so there was a very small team of physiotherapists, but where possible we did try and um, minimise that. Thank you, thank you. Yes. <laughs> so thank you very much, Lindsay, and we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you. So, our next speaker is Glenn Nielsen. No, would you mind? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to follow what you're doing. I think I've got my uh, slides already. Uh, yes. Is it one of these? It's, it's, um, 
a skull seminar <laughs> specifically labeled. Okay. And then did we do this one down here? Great. Thank you so much. Glenn, take it away. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Glenn Nielsen. Uh, I have a clinical and academic post here at St George's. So my clinical work is a, I run a specialist physiotherapy service for functional neurological disorder. And my research work is looking into developing uh, evidence-based interventions for functional neurological disorder and also some work on mechanism. So today I wanted to describe what functional neurological disorder actually is because many people, perhaps most of the general public, haven't heard about it and then talk about my journey to developing uh, evidence-based uh, physiotherapy. Um, I'm running a multi-center randomized controlled trial and I'd hope to be able to share with some of the results of that with you today but I think we're about two months away from being able to do that. So it's going to be the journey there. So uh, within every field of medicine, there are people with symptoms that are unexplained by disease. So for example, in gastroenterology, there's irritable bowel syndrome. In rheumatology, there's fibromyalgia. And in neurology, these conditions called functional neurological disorder. So now it's primarily described as neurological symptoms that are experienced by the individual as involuntary. Um, and the symptoms themselves or the primary pathophysiology has been described as related to altered functioning of brain networks rather than structural disease. So you may look at that and note that psychological causation has been removed from this definition. This is a relatively new idea and it's because psychological pathology isn't consistent amongst patients nor is it taken into account when the diagnosis is made. I can't go into much more detail on that at the moment. A recent Lancet Neurology authoritative paper described that there are five main or core symptoms in, in FND, and these are motor symptoms, so that can include tremor, weakness, or a gait disorder. Uh, sensory symptoms, some patients have numbness, some patients have no sensation at all in a particular limb, so they won't even experience pain. Um, or they might have pins and needles, and they can also have disorders of uh, the primary or the special senses, such as vision and, and sound. Uh, functional seizures are common. Sometimes these resemble epilepsy, or there might be moments of absences. There's functional dizziness, which is now called triple PD, which stands for persistent perceptual postural dizziness. I like to write it down because I sometimes get that. Uh, the wrong way around. And then there are cognitive symptoms, sometimes described as cognitive fog. So you can see it's quite a complex sort of group of conditions and the terminology itself is quite complex. Uh, for example, it used to be called conversion disorder. And prior to that, these patients were often described as having hysteria. So as well as these uh, core symptoms, uh, patients, so patients can have one of them, but typically have a combination of them. And they often also have other physical symptoms, such as persistent pain, fatigue. Uh, perhaps about a third of women with functional motor symptoms also have bladder and or bowel symptoms, such as urinary retention, speech and swallowing problems and headache. And of course, patients can have psychological symptoms such as anxiety, depression. There is some crossover with PTSD, interpersonal difficulties and dissociation. So in the past, psychological problems have been thought of part of the core uh, symptoms of FND, but there's a move towards thinking about these as risk factors for developing uh, neurological symptoms. Um, functional symptoms in neurology are very common, and perhaps the best data we have on this comes from this uh, study from Scotland, where they got almost every outpatient neurologist, I think all except for one, to rate the extent to which symptoms are explained by disease in consecutive patients. So from 3,700 patients over 18 months, they found that the neurologist's perception anyway was that 70% of patients had symptoms that were explained by a neurological disease. 18% had symptoms that were partially explained. So this might be somebody, for example, who has migraine and then some weakness that couldn't be explained by the migraine or any other pathology. Or another example might be somebody with Parkinson's disease with relatively mild symptoms, and they might have some sort of hemiplegic weakness, which you can't correlate with a structural cause. And then there are 12% of patients with functional neurological symptoms in outpatient neurology. So it's pretty common. 
When they followed up that 30% that had symptoms that were not completely explained by disease, they found that only four of them had acquired a neurological disease that wasn't detected at baseline. So this suggests that it's a stable diagnosis, and this diagnosis is quite rare. So it's a diagnosis made by a neurologist. It used to be considered a diagnosis of exclusion, but now it's based on the clinical examination of the symptoms themselves. So they're looking for ruling signs that show that the underlying nervous system is functioning normally. And there are specific clinical signs that uh, have been validated with high sensitivity and specificity. So I'll just show you a quick video of somebody, of, this is Professor John Stone, a neurologist, who's doing a Hoover sign on this woman who has right limb, right leg weakness. So she had weakness in her right leg, she couldn't extend the leg. Via a reflex mechanism, really, when she flexed her left leg, the power returned to the right leg. And really what we think about now is this shows that, that it's a problem with voluntary control of movement. So it's also important for these patients to have reasonable investigations in neurology. One of the main reasons for that is functional symptoms commonly coexist with other neurological disease. And very rarely functional symptoms can exist as part of a prodrome to some other neurological condition. Prognosis is considered poor. This systematic review of long-term follow-up studies included about 10,000 patients. They followed them up over seven years and they found that the neurological symptoms had resolved in 20% of patients, so 80% remained symptomatic, and 40% of patients had symptoms that were either the same or continued to get worse over time. And these results were replicated in another more recent study in patients with functional weakness. They followed them up over 14 years. And what I think is particularly interesting is that this group had a higher than expected rate of mortality um, for their age. And I think what they, the most of the causes of death were lifestyle related illnesses, so cardiovascular disease, really. So it shows a patient group that become ill, they stop leaving the house, they become very sedentary, and they develop secondary problems. And partly that's because. In the healthcare system, you do nothing to help these patients mostly. Because what actually happens is that patients with these sorts of neurological symptoms are often referred, and certainly this is what happened in the past, to neurorehabilitation services. And many neurorehab services or physical rehab services said, well, this is a mental health problem. And so they excluded the patients, they rejected the referrals. And then when we'd refer patients to mental health services, they'd see the patient perhaps in a wheelchair and say, well, you have a physical problem we don't have the capacity to do physical rehabilitation. So they've fallen between the gaps and lots of these patients, and there's lots of them, got no treatment at all. So we started uh, looking at this uh, about 10 to 15 years ago now, and one of the first things we did was a survey of physiotherapists. We surveyed all the physiotherapists in the uh, neurology special interest group. Uh, we didn't survey all of them. We got a 60% return rate. And uh, we, we found that many of them worked in services that rejected referrals. But for the physiotherapists that did see people with FND, it made up about 10% of their workload. So physiotherapists, neurophysiotherapists were seeing FND. Uh, they liked treating them, but they rated their confidence and their skills as low. And this was part, probably because there was almost nothing written in the literature about what they should do to help. And there was no evidence-based interventions described. So one of the next things we did was we assembled a group of experts, neuropsychiatrists, neurologists, and of course, physiotherapists. And we developed this consensus recommendation for physiotherapy treatment. So we described what we thought was a good approach to treatment from a referral to physiotherapy all the way to discharge. Where possible, this was based on available evidence, but there wasn't a lot. So some of it was expert opinion and evidence borrowed from other conditions. And we described an overall treatment approach where the motor symptoms of FMD can be conceptualized as abnormally learnt patterns of movement that are driven by attention and expectation. So I'm going to show you what I mean by that with some videos. So this person has a tremor affecting her right hand. You can see the tremor. 
But as I distract her by getting her to tap the fingers in her left hand, the tremor stops. And that's because her attention is forced away from her right hand. When you stop distracting somebody with a functional tremor, the attention just goes back and the tremor returns. So functional symptoms require attention to manifest. When you distract somebody's attention, usually with a physical task, cognitive distraction isn't as good, but it does also work sometimes, the symptoms resolve. So it's a problem associated with attention amongst many other things. Here's an example of somebody with a gait disorder. So what happened to this lady? She had quite extensive abdominal surgery. She had a very painful abdominal incision site. When she stood up straight, she stretched that painful incision and she developed these jerks and walking. She's been walking like this for two years and she was diagnosed with dystonia actually. Watch what happens. She reaches the end of the corridor here and turns. Can you see those steps are a little bit more normal? Just those steps at the end. Just see if I can play them again. These ones here, there and there. They're quite normal steps. So what's happening is she's trying to walk. She's trying not to fall. She's working very hard rather than moving like we always do automatically. We don't think about our feet. This person is and people with FND do think about their feet. But she gets to the end, she's relieved and she just does an automatic step and there shows some automatic movement. So this sort of impact of attention on movement is a way that physiotherapists and physical rehabilitation can have a way in. Um, just move on to my next. We also did some qualitative research um, in patients undergoing treatment and some of the important thing, themes that came out from the patients that we talked to was they generally unsurprisingly felt abandoned by the NHS. And often when they were diagnosed, they were given quite simplistic psychological explanations for their symptoms. So this is happening because you're a bit stressed, which often didn't match their experience, which might have been a very scary and frightening abdominal surgery, leading a very painful abdominal incision. And so they were dissatisfied with simplistic psychological explanations, and they didn't feel that those explanations led to helpful treatments. They felt that nobody knew what was wrong with them, and of course that was very frightening, and they felt powerless to change. So with all of this accumulated sort of understanding and input from a large group of people, we developed our treatment protocol. So we had a five-day intensive physiotherapy treatment program. Um, it was led by an interactive workbook, so it's very much based on education and understanding symptoms, understanding the role of attention, and the many other risk factors and precipitating factors that can affect the individual in a personalised formulation. They underwent movement retraining. I just realised that some of my models are in the room. And um, they developed a symptom management plan. So this was an intensive treatment programme developed that was conducted over five consecutive days. We ran that through our uh, outpatient NHS service. So with 47 consecutive patients, um, and uh, followed them up over three months. This is the EQ5D, which is a health related quality of life scale used by NICE. And we saw that there was a, a trajectory of improvement in patients that had had symptoms over five years. So this is the, the lady that I showed you before um, who had this walking pattern. And her treatment was about once she sort of understood this role of attention, she was trying to generate some automatic movement through fast and quick movements and rotation. So physiotherapy is like a graded movement approach. And here's her sort of trying to take control of her movement. There she is at a six month follow up. So, you know, quite a short intervention, a relatively simple intervention can have quite a profound effect in the right patient. Um, but how many of these patients are out there that's I guess the question that we uh, want to answer. And as part of all of this, we uh, did a lot of uh, patient and public involvement. So the person I just showed you is one of our service users who's heavily still involved in our research. And we've had a lot of PPI involved in sort of developing our intervention approach and developing our research ideas. So we put them all together in a randomized feasibility study, which we completed in 2016. Uh, we had 60 patients, 30 were randomised to our five-day intervention, the other 30 to treatment as usual, which was a referral to a standard community neurophysiotherapist. We followed them up over six months. In our intervention group, 70% uh, rated themselves, the patients, as improved compared to 30% of the controls. And we had in the EQ5D some still interesting results that were suggestive that it could be an effective intervention. 
Um, and also in our, in our feasibility study, of course, we developed all of that information that you need to define a, a fully powered definitive trial. So we got information on effect size, dropout rates, acceptability to fit into our power uh, size calculation. And we won a grant to run the fully powered trial, which we called Physio for FMD. Um, this was a pragmatic, single blind, multi center trial, which started in 2018. And uh, it was set up at 11 sites around Scotland and England. Here are the 18 physiotherapists involved in delivering the intervention. Um, and they recently just come back. This is a photo where they've come back just recently after completing the intervention for a bit of a debrief session. So we started recruiting in 2019 and we ran into a spot of bother with COVID. So our sample size was to be 300. And we were about a month or two out from the end of our recruitment period. We had 267. We were a shoe in to reach our sample calculation. Uh, but COVID hit and we were forced to stop uh, recruiting uh, uh, when lockdown started in March 2020. At that time, we had about 130 in each group. But in the intervention group, there were 27 patients or participants who had just been randomised, but hadn't yet started their intervention because uh, they were just waiting for it to start. And so we would have had only 105 minus uh, dropouts in that group. Unfortunately, in the controls, there were 61 still waiting to receive their intervention. So they were more in the control group because their control was a, a pragmatic treatment as usual in the NHS, and they had to wait a few extra months to start their treatment, so there were more still waiting. So what we would have ended up with is either a diluted effect size or a very underpowered trial. Um, and we were lucky enough to receive a costed extension from the NIHR. And so with this extension, we recruited an extra 89 participants. Uh, so in total, we have a 355. And um, we've followed them all up over 12 months. And we have a very high retention rate of 90%, thanks to Anne-Marie, who really chased everybody down. Um, and so these patients are now being analysed. Um, but we had a decision to make about what we were going to do with those patients who didn't receive because their treatment because of COVID. And we really need to think about this and describe it, obviously, before our analysis. We need to think about it in terms of the intention to treat principle, a really core principle for randomised controlled trials. So we took a lot of advice and what we decided to do is look at the patients in th uh, all together. But in, there were three groups, essentially. Uh, we had only 25 that had been treated and followed up before COVID hit. 134 who were treated, but then they did their six and 12 month follow up during lockdown. So this may have influenced how they answered questions about things like mental health and physical disability if they weren't leaving the house. We had lots of questions about gait. There were 89% of you who received no treatment because of COVID, so 89 patients. And then there were 88, I think that should be 89, in the uh, post-COVID recruit extension. And so what we've decided to do was exclude the COVID people from our primary analysis and just include the people who received treatment. And we will do a big sensitivity analysis, which will include all patients to see the effect of excluding those people from our primary analysis. So we have a large group of our uh, primary and secondary outcome measures. A primary outcome measure is the physical function domain of the SF36. And we're doing a very, very thorough uh, health economic analysis, and we hope to do a, a large cost of illness study. And the data from this is surprising how expensive this patient group in terms of how many of them are attending A&E and hospital for well, things related to F&D, but also things related to comorbid health problems. Uh, we've got other research going on, but just to finish off, to acknowledge the really large number of people who contributed to the work that I've presented today. So thank you very much. I'm happy to answer some questions. Thank you so much, Luke. Do we have any questions from the audience or online? Thank you. Nice, nice, nice. It really matter to deal with the COVID issues. So, you were quite cautious when you were saying it's considered to be a problem with networks or tensions if it's not 100% clear what FND really is. I mean, does any of this help confirm or perhaps cast doubt on any of your 
ideas about mechanisms? No, it doesn't. Uh, help, but um, I'd like to just leave the answer there. But uh, no, so this is obviously a rehabilitation study. So this is a long debate about why it's described as a, a, a disorder, a network disorder. So, and it's hard to do a succinct answer, but psychological comorbidity isn't consistent amongst the group. And there are probably many multiple factors uh, that uh, cause or, or, or precipitate uh, functional disorders and mental health is thought to be a risk factor. The idea that it's a network problem comes from a really quite large and growing group of research that looks at networks about why somebody might develop a tremor as opposed to weakness, as opposed to not being able to feel their leg, as opposed to jerks or fixed dystonia or seizures. And so these sorts of network sort of this idea of it being a network disorder comes from studies that look at, uh, I guess, fMRI studies that show abnormal connections between, say, the amygdala and brain areas associated with threat with brain areas associated with movement in the primary motor cortex. This is really not my area of expertise, but um, it's really the idea that it's a brain problem and to describe it as either a physical problem or a mental health problem is a dualistic way of thinking about it, which we kind of got stuck into for about a, you know, a couple of hundred years and it led to nowhere. And the idea of just sort of opening out, broadening out the definition to a true biopsychosocial definition has led to things like physiotherapy and more targeted psychotherapy. Not a great answer to your question, but <laughs> the best I can do is what means. Maybe I'll ask one. Please. So um, at the beginning, uh, sort of early on in your talk, you sort of mentioned that, that lots of patients fell through the gaps and maybe about 20% of them actually improved with very right. little intervention perhaps. Mm -hmm. In a best case scenario, what do you think your interventions are going to, to, to do? What sort of improvement or proportion of the patient group might improve using your intervention? So it's, it's a really great question, but a tricky one, because how you describe improvement in a patient with complex <laughs> problems and multicomorbidity is difficult. So. For example, the typical patient might have had 10 years of chronic pain, which doesn't go away, and they might also have something like diabetes and other chronic health problems, and then often develop functional neurological symptoms. So they might have a gait disorder, like the person I showed you, the gait disorder might improve, and they might be left with chronic pain and maybe chronic fatigue. So when we ask them about their primary symptom, I would like to think that around 60% of patients show improvement. Uh, with, a, with this type of treatment and maybe 40% don't. What I didn't talk about was how we select patients. So we select about 35% of patients for this type of physiotherapy treatment. The other two thirds have complex, uh, more uh, multidisciplinary treatment, uh, which involves psychological therapy, or they might have another treatment such as specialist chronic pain rehabilitation. So. I think and I'm hopeful around 60% of patients will improve uh, of that 30% that we, we treat in physiotherapy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hi, hello. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm just wondering if at the end when you looked at your controls and study population and how to go to and D, whether there was a difference in the delay from treatment to delivery of um, physiotherapy. Um, and whether you looked at whether that had impacted on outcomes, there's a bit of another delay in control groups. Yeah, that's something we're going to look at. So there's a number of ways that could go. What I'm worried about is that with these types of conditions, there's often um, a peak treatment effect and then a loss of treatment effect over time. And if the control group is delayed, they might complete their primary outcome closer to the peak treatment effect. And if the interventions were treated a little bit earlier, they might be lower on that treatment effect. And I think in the end, there are so many other factors that contribute to that. I don't think you can sort of pull it apart so specifically. It's, it's just a lot of noise. Um, so, so we're going to look at that and see what we can make of that, but it's a bit too early at the moment. 
Sorry, I'm just searching off what position I talk about. Yep, we're just about to wrap up. Any more questions? And nothing online. So thank you so much, Dwayne. Before everything disappears. Before everyone disappears, can I invite you to come to the collaborative space? I'm hoping that Cake has miraculously appeared. And please uh, use it as an opportunity to just say hello to your colleagues and uh, and continue a little bit of networking. Thanks and join us next time.